I've been preparing my next Daily Thunder series, and this is not it, by the way. I'm not giving a Daily Thunder message. This is a sermon. But I'm preparing that, and my working title is The Life, Life and Leadership Lessons from Teddy Roosevelt. And it's very compelling. It's a very compelling series. And uh, in the process uh, of studying Teddy Roosevelt, who's a very dynamic uh, character, uh, possibly the most unique president we've ever had, uh, very large personality, but he was a boxer. And so I, I started doing a sub-study on boxing because I was thinking of introducing that into one of my uh, messages because there's this really cool uh, scene where he knocks a guy out. It's a bad guy. He, he knocked a bad guy out. And it's a great movie scene. And <clears throat> so I was doing a sub-study on boxing. And some of the sub-studies I do, I know some of you could be a little concerned about me. Uh, World War I, World War II, I think I covered the Civil War. Uh, then... Uh, Alfred the Great, who was a whole bunch of war, boxing. It's like, Eric, do you have some fetish for violence? Actually, I am not a violent man. I have no interest in bopping someone in the nose, picking up a gun, shooting it. I have no interest. I am not inclined in that direction. But for whatever reason, when I see a metaphorical picture, something that parallels the spiritual life, it's like moth to flame. And boxing surprisingly has taken uh, me by storm uh, to the point where I was so deeply intrigued that it ended up becoming a sermon. <laughs> okay, so I mean, I don't know how you guys are going to respond to this. We'll find out. Maybe I, I probably shouldn't even ask you afterwards, right? It's just like, you know what? I gave it. You know, you heard it. Let's move on. But it could change your life. This has greatly impacted me. And so my, my title, Remaking the Boxer. So one of the arguments that sort of started this out, and I, I talked about it, I think, in a devotional this week to even the work crew here, is that arguably athletes in every sport uh, across uh, you know, all sports, you just think about all sports, the modern athlete would beat head-to-head -head a, a previous generation's athletes. That the modern athlete is superior for whatever reason. I mean, that's at least the idea that's floating out there. And now some of it could have to do with diet and different ways that we're able to treat and help the body achieve higher performance. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine that people are just taller and stronger today than they were. I'm sure that there's some enhancement process that is going on. But there is one sport even though I'd sort of like to include gymnastics in it as well, but one sport that arguably is fairly clear that the modern version would actually get trounced by the previous generation's version, and that's boxing. Now, if you say that out there publicly and you read the forums on it, anyone that's young and that likes boxing gets so offended over that. It's all the old guys, you know, that just sound like grandpa and they're all crotchety that are convinced that boxing isn't what it used to be, that it has lost its sweetness. You see, boxing is sort of a dance. It's like a male form of dancing, I guess you could call it that. That it is an art form, it's called the sweet science. And so the way a, a boxer moves is rhythm, it's timing. And when you understand that, it actually is awe-inspiring. And most of us don't. We just don't un understand it. We, some of you have never even seen a boxing match. You're offended by the, even the concept of a boxing match, two guys punching each other. And I, I get that. That's the same thing I deal with. I, I look back and I grew up watching boxing. And my dad loved boxing. He's not around anymore to defend himself uh, you know, about it. It's like, Dad, why did you get me into boxing? I mean, wh why was I watching this? However... Growing up, I grew up in, I guess, what would have been the deteriorating end to the golden era of boxing. And so, you know, my favorite boxers were like Sugar Ray Leonard and uh, Marvin Hag Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Uh, and so that was like my, my generation, which is, well, I don't know what that would have been, mid-80s. And uh, so I really got into it. I mean, I had... 
It's uh, embarrassing to say. I had posters on my wall. I mean, what, what do you, a yeah, poster of a boxer on your wall? What are you doing, Eric? I mean, I'm wondering the same thing now as I'm giving this message, having that thought even come into my head. But the argument goes that there has been a deterioration, that the older boxers of a previous era are superior, and that what they knew is lost today. The sweet science that no one is even around that can train it anymore. All the old trainers that taught, you know, the Joe Lewis's all the way through the Muhammad Ali's, they're, they're gone. And with them goes the knowledge, the secrets of the craft of boxing. And so even if you have superior athletes, you don't have superior knowledge today. And so that sweet science is lost. And so what's happened to boxing, I'm going to start with this as a premise, is that we've remade it. And it's something that it, wasn't, was, that it wasn't in the past, so that the modern boxer doesn't even know the difference. The modern audience cannot tell the difference. Now, I'm drawing a parallel here, just in case you're wondering if my whole message is on boxing. It's actually on the spiritual life. That we have lost something in the handoff of generations that the discipleship process throughout the generations, which passes along what I could call the sweet science of Christianity, has been lost. To say that the modern Christian, though we have more access to data, though we can search for a Greek term, a, a Hebrew term, just with the push of a button, that the modern version would be trounced by a previous generation's version. That's a premise point that I'm going to set out there that would probably offend all of us since we're the modern version. And yet what I'm gonna say is the previous generation, I'm not just gonna say our parents' generation or even their parents' generation, but you go back and you're going to find in generations long ago that there was a superior version of Christianity that had something. And that if you were from back then and you jettisoned forward in some time machine to see the modern version, You'd say that, guys, you don't understand the sweet science. You don't understand how this works. One illustration of that is the fact of how we handle crisis, difficulty, and trials. Our default as a generation is to complain. Our default as a generation is to grumble about our circumstances if they're difficult. However, you go back to the sweet science of Christianity, and that is the primary moment of rejoicing and thanksgiving. This is when a athlete gets stronger. And so this art form of Christianity somehow has deteriorated to the point where we don't even notice that. We don't even call it into question. We can read the scriptures about it, but we don't see the contradiction in our midst. So this is dedicated to Lily, and you could say a, a, a message on boxing. Well, it's her birthday, right? So I need to uh, make this, but th look at this. God built you to take down giants. Isn't that fun to have this message be yours? This is dedicated to Lily, her 12th birthday. So there's a picture of Joe Frazier, and this is his quote. He was talking about the way that the greats before him were trained. And in every generation, there's new methods of training, always. And so this is Joe Frazier's famous quote. It was good enough for them, it's good enough for me. I want to be trained like the old guys. Now that's Joe Frazier talking. It's also Eric Ludy talking. This is like how I popped out of the spiritual womb. Modern books, I don't like those. Give me an old book, right? Now, technically that can get you in trouble too. There's a lot of bad old books too. But I want the old school version. I want the Joe Frazier, I want the uh, Joe Lewis version of Christianity and the one that understood the sweet science. So desiring to box like the greats, is it possible to be trained by Angelo Dundee, Eddie Futch, or Teddy Atlas? This is the way my soul has been. Now, I, I, I don't actually want to be trained as a boxer. I want to be trained as a Christian. And so I want one of the greats to train me. Have you guys ever had that longing inside of your soul that it's like, okay, how do I get trained to be a great boxer or a great Christian in our context. So my daily prayer for five years, five years of my life, Lord, supply me a father of the faith, a man who can teach me how to walk the ancient paths. This was a prayer. I, I, I remember reading in the Apocrypha this one statement that said, and by the way, I, I do not hold the Apocrypha as canon. However, it's very 
interesting writing and you can get a lot out of it. And so there was this one statement and I think it was one of the proverbial uh, segments and it said something like, when you find a godly man, wear out his doorstep. It's like, huh. And so what I was wanting is I wanted a giant of the faith, some man like Leonard Ravenhill, here was my short list that I was hinting. Leonard Ravenhill, Richard Wormbrand, yeah, one of those, to take me under his wing and to instruct me how this works. So that was my daily prayer for five years. Every day I prayed that prayer. Now, this is gonna sound strange, but I've had multiple daily prayers throughout my life and I've watched God answer them every time. In this one, five years, I felt like he answered me, but not with what I was asking for. I, I never got what I was thinking I was going to get. In fact, I never even got to meet Richard Wormbrand before he died or Leonard Ravenhill. And so it was like this sense of disappointment. It's like, Lord, did you not hear my prayer? And I felt like he answered, but in a different way. And that was, Eric, if you're willing, I'm going to teach you the hard way, but I want to make you the answer to that prayer for the next generation. And in a sense, I could say that is the formation of Ellerslie right there. It's like, okay, I didn't get something. And some of you could say the same. I didn't get something when I was young. But are you willing to be the answer to that same prayer for the next generation of Christians? My letter to a godly old man, summer 1993. So I even wrote the guy, right? This is my letter to this godly old man. Old man, living life upon your knees, teach me what you know. I only wish to one day have a friendship like you have with God. How can I live a life of total dependence upon him? How can I find the wondrous truth you have discovered? Old man, you, will, you have something sacred that I desire. Will you teach me how to live on my knees? Will you teach me how to rejoice in suffering and how to make the devil flee? Old man, how do you stay quiet before the Lord? How do you study and meditate upon his word? How do you pray? And how do you approach his throne? How do you listen to his still small voice? Old man, through time, you have been crafted, molded by the master's hands. Tell me what I must do to find the strength to stand. An old man, what does it mean to be a man? 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27 is Paul speaking to a church that is actually not very healthy. And the church at Corinth is fallen to pieces. It's divided. And he's laying a foundation of understanding of how a Christian, if I could say it this way, it's the old trainer from the golden era of boxing talking to a young, very strong athlete known as the church at Corinth, saying, guys, if you're going to get your game on, if you're going to be able to fight this fight, I'm going to give you some cues of how this works. He's passing along the sweet science to them. Do you not know, says Paul, that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight. The actual word is box. So hey, look at this. This is a biblical message I'm getting into. Thus I box, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I've preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So there's a right way and an appropriate way to utilize this strength that you have. And if you're going to run, run the race route. <laughs> run along the track. Stay in your lane. Why would you just run randomly? You're not going to win the prize if you do that. If you're going to swing, make sure you know your opponent and you know when to swing. The art of timing is everything in boxing. If you just randomly start swinging, your opponent will knock you out because he's just waiting for you to put your energy this way and he's going to go boom. You see, everything is half defense, half offense in boxing. And so you have to know when to swing. You do not just punch the air. You have to have that timing. You need to be a seasoned veteran in this sport to be effective with this opponent who is very good at knocking you out. And so when, if you're going to do this, you need to do it well. Boxing, the sweet science. Now, for some of you, that, that sounds contradictory. Modern boxing is sort of a vulgar version of old-fashioned boxing. 
it's violent. And it's violent on purpose because that sells tickets. The modern generation has swallowed a version of boxing that is very different than the previous. Now, I can't excuse boxing from the fact that it's a violent sport no matter how you cut it, even if it's just the sweet science version, the old school version. And I think it is reasonable to question the, uh, the healthfulness of such a sport, if that makes sense. Usually the guys getting into it, some of them can be very angry young guys that are looking to beat someone up. I think it was Mike Tyson that says uh, something like, swing with bad intentions or punching with bad intentions. Every punch he swung, he wanted to kill the guy. It's like, you know what? I think I'm going to call that into question and say that's probably a little unhealthy, right? So it's not the support of boxing. It's the illustration of it because spiritually, we have an opponent, and we have what we could call a sanctioned fight. Because, you know, th that enemy, you know, says, hey, I want to fight him. And then God has to sanction the fight, strangely enough. And so suddenly the sanction, sanctioned fight happens and ding, it goes off. And we're still sitting in our corner. The enemy's walking across and poof, he's beating us up and we didn't even know we were in a match yet. You see, we don't understand the game that we are in. We are swinging randomly instead of understanding what it means to be a boxer. So Sugar Ray Leonard versus Marvelous Marvin Hagler, the proving of Eric Ludi, April 6, 1987. Isn't that funny? I remember this moment. So this is a big match. This is like a pay-per-view. You had to have a special service to be able to watch it. And my pastor had such a special service. You had to wonder us about such a pastor that's like uh, inviting people over to watch boxing. But I was 16 at this exact time, and I was in a very important season of my life. My parents had gone on a trip to Hawaii and left us, left my brother and I at home, and someone would just sort of come and make meals for us. It was a couple that would come over, and they would just sort of, they were sort of there to create some structure and stability, which my brother and I didn't really like too much because it's like, hey, I'm 16 is what I'm thinking. I don't need this. But I think for my parents' uh, psychological, you know, uh, balance, they needed some type of checks uh, and balance system for us. So my parents had come back, and little did I know that off to the side, this couple had become very, very concerned about me and my brother. Because we would come home from school, and we would go straight to the park, and I was shooting baskets with my buddies. That's what I would do. And when they were in high school they were a part of a similar routine. They would come home and then they would go to the park and they would deal drugs. And so they were convinced that because we were so outgoing and so alive, big smiles on our faces, that we were on drugs. And they told my parents that. They said, we've observed them. We've come to the conclusion that your boys are both doing drugs. I didn't know this. Okay, so I'm still outgoing, having a great time, right? Well, my, my pastor uh, used to be heavy duty into drugs. And so my parents confided in him and he, he looked at them and he said, okay, well, why not? I'll spend some time with Eric and just sort of observe him, see if he is showing any uh, signs of that. So my pastor invites me over to his house for the Sugar Ray Leonard Marvelous Marvin Hagler fight. I have never been so blessed because the church to me at this point in my life I wasn't impressed, okay? I was, my, my brother and I were called the boys, the Ludi boys. You know, my name's Eric, okay? I don't want to be the Ludi boys. Why do I always get clumped in with Marky? It's like, no, I'm, I'm Eric. And so, but no one in the church, but one guy knew my name. And so I was rather dubious about the church. I, I, I thought Jesus was great, but this whole church thing was really hard for me. And then my pastor invites me over. He's like speaking my love language here, guys. I mean, he's inviting me over for this fight and he's going to pay for it. And he's going to supply all the food. It's like, I was so moved. I remember I took all the money I had. I brought it with me that night and I handed it to him as an offering to the church. Now, I don't know that I had a lot of money, but <laughs> that's how moved I was by the fact that my pastor showed personal attention in me and invited me over for this. I mean, I gave everything I had to the church. Like, okay, God, maybe I had this wrong. Maybe the church is great. I didn't know that I was being watched. That the whole thing was an evaluation of if I was on drugs. 
I mean, that was like really hard for me to swallow afterwards. I'm going to call this the proving because I remember the night so vividly. And I remember the disappointment I had afterwards in realizing the only reason I was invited was because of this accusation against me. First of all, I had to deal with an accusation against me, which wasn't true. Never taken drugs in my life. I have no interest in taking drugs, right? I mean, it's sort of the opposite of my personality type, even though supposedly that was my personality type. And so this was a real challenging situation for me. It was also proving, I mean, here I am, the church is where my heart is. But I've had to go through multiple zingers along the way to say, Eric, where do you stand? Are you going to follow me? Are you going to love the ones I love, even if they're imperfect? Very unique trial for me. So here's uh, the Sports Illustrated, the showdown. Hagler versus Leonard. I don't think you guys realize how exciting that was. Yeah, Sugar Ray won. Uh, oh, it was a tough, tough loss for Hagler. I think I was secretly cheering for marvelous Marvin Hagler, and then he lost. But I did like Sugar Ray, too, so it was a tough one for me. The ingredients of the great boxer. Now, as I go through this, I know some of you are so not interested in boxing. However, I'm not talking about boxing. As I go through all of this, I want you to listen as the spiritual life because you're in a ring and you have a sanctioned fight that God is allowing in your life. That enemy is coming at you and God says, I've given you all that you need for life and godliness. Stand up, go fight. Like, I don't know how to fight. He goes, you want to learn? You see, we got the greatest trainer of all time who knows the art He knows the sweet science, but we have to submit to him and say, God, I need wisdom. That's what wisdom is. It's the sweet science. So the ingredients of the great boxer, smarts, sharpness, skill, and soundness of mind. Now watch what's going to happen up on the screen. I'm going to click this button. The ingredients of a great boxer, smarts, sharpness, skill, and soundness of mind. Listen, while someone is trying to kill you. You see, that's the one thing about boxing that's different than any other sport. You could take any other skill like surgery. You know, you're a great surgeon, but someone's not carving into you with a knife while you're trying to do this incredibly delicate process. Boxing is an art form. You have to be sound of judgment at all times. You, you let down your guard, boom, you're knocked out. You have to keep your mind sound. You have to stay focused while someone is trying to pound your head. What I just described is Christianity. We need to do what we do with excellence. And we can't let down our guard. Meanwhile, we have someone who's trying to knock us out the whole time, who's trying to inflict pain. There's pain points in your body. And guess what? Your enemy knows exactly where they're at. And if he sees you bleeding in a spot, he's going to keep hammering on that spot. See, little did you know how much boxing is similar to your life. Mike Silver says this, what a boxer is attempting to do athletically, he is doing while being hit in the face, the solar plexus or the liver. He has to accept that kind of pain and keep going. It is the toughest sport in the world, bar none. But what I'm speaking of is not boxing. What I'm speaking of is a sweet science known as Christianity. It is the hardest sport in the world, bar none. Little did you know what you signed up for. You signed up for the hardest sport to be an athlete in a ring against an opponent. Now, ironically, even if you didn't sign up for it, you'd still be in that ring against an opponent. You'd just be dead. You'd be hammered. We have the possibility of having a trainer and having his power given to us so that we can actually win in this ring known as our body. Remaking the boxer. Something is different in the last 25 to 30 years years. Now, if you hear any of the old guys talk, like I said, it sounds a little like sour grapes. It sounds a little like the old grandpa thing. It's like, oh, back in my day. I mean, it sounds just like that. However, what if it's right? What if it's true that back in their day, there really was something better? So here's the differences between a modern boxer and and an old-fashioned boxer. Today's boxers fight twice a year, versus twice a month. What, what is the difference level in your knowledge of a sport and your skill development in a sport when you're fighting twice a month as opposed to twice a year? It's enormous. Muscle-bound men versus limber, lightning-fast men. Today, ever since the Rocky movies, 
everyone wants to look like Rocky Balboa. And so they want to get muscular because that's the look. But back in the day, it was actually limberness and lightning quickness that actually won the day. Because if you're big and muscular, you swing like this. When you're lean, you can actually do the straight on shots, which makes you so much more dangerous. Demolition machines. Now they want to build boxers to just crush people. It used to be the bob and weave artists. Again, it was a dance. And those that loved the art of boxing recognized it. And they stood in awe of someone who could do it. Most of us, if we watched a video, wouldn't know the difference. We'd be like, oh, it just looks like someone boxing. So there's uh, Sylvester Stallone on the left, and then there's Jack Dempsey on the right. And you'll notice, the, and I don't really want you to focus too much on body, uh, but you'll notice that the bodies are very different, yet Jack Dempsey had the perfect boxing body. And he doesn't look like a Hollywood body. And that's part of what I think we need to understand is that what we oftentimes get in the spirit of the age is there's a certain way you're supposed to live, the certain way you're supposed to act, the certain way you're supposed to look. However, to be great in the sweet science of Christianity, you need to look like Christ, even if it doesn't look as good to the world. The muscle monsters versus the mental monsters. What makes a great boxer, according to every trainer, is that they are a mental monster. They're not muscular. Muscularity comes with training, but you don't need to add to it. You don't need to try and bulk up a man. They will get power when they know how to leverage what they have and they do it quickly. And the same is true with all of us that we don't need to pack on something additional. We need to leverage what God has given us with lightning ferocity. Appreciating the sweet science. So I'm going to give you some quotes. Remember, I'm not talking about boxing. There are no super skilled boxers like Tippy Larkin, Billy Graham, or Maxi Shapiro. I don't see them around. So Mike Capriano Jr., his dad trained uh, like some of the greatest boxers of all time. So he's the son, and then he was also a boxing trainer. So he comes from that era. I don't see them around. There were many types of fighters, and you'd see many different styles, and that is probably what made them better fighters. I don't see anyone with that type of skill today in any weight division. Some of the today's fighters look good and they seem to have the natural instincts and maybe somebody is teaching them, but I don't see the moves. They need more seasoning. You don't see a fighter bend and weave in anymore. You might see someone bob back and forth and move in, but that's, your classic, that's not your classic bend and weave move. Even Tyson didn't do that. He'd bob back and forth, but he would just try and distract you and then he would throw one of those overhand punches. Tyson bullied his way in. He bobbed, but he didn't weave. He tried to overpower you and when he couldn't overpower you, he got stymied. Tyson really had no moves. We don't see fighters today sliding in. We don't see, their, see the feints, the hook off of feints, step to the right and uppercut, moving, grabbing an elbow and spinning the fighter. We don't see any of that today because it's gone. And nobody knows how to teach it. You don't see any of these fighters making the same moves as the old fighters. Absolutely not. The fans today never saw these fighters. Here's another quote. This guy's a big boxing fan. He's a neuroscientist. Not that that needs to be mentioned, but just to show you, he's not some brainless guy. If today's fans were shown some full-length film of Sugar Ray Robinson, they would think it was something different and unusual. But they wouldn't understand what he was doing. It is a different language. They used to be, there used to be skill and grace. There's no beauty anymore. Here's Wilbur Skeeter McClure. He was a contemporary with Muhammad Ali and fought for the Olympic team. Boxing, in my opinion, is the only sport where the participants haven't gotten better since the 30s, 40s, and 50s. The fighters of today couldn't even hold a candle to the fighters of the 60s and 70s. They just couldn't do it. They were simply too tough, too strong, too savvy, and too skilled. And part of the reason is because they fought more frequently. You have champions today that fight once or twice a year. Anybody who applies his craft to any trade or profession and only performs it only twice a year can't be good. You just can't develop that way. So this is uh, Teddy Atlas, who is a famous trainer uh, from the golden era of boxing, comparing yesterday's fighters against today's, basically saying, okay, if you set the best of today's fighter against the best of yesteryear's fighter, what would happen? And this guy gets mad. These guys always get mad at that question. So my question of the, of, to the guys of today's era that say that the modern muscular size is too much for the old guys is where are these big heavyweights going to find a way to deal with that experience, that science, and that mental toughness of the old timers? Because today's fighters are depleted of these qualities. Depleted. The old timers had all those qualities. 
I don't think it would be fair to sanction the fight between them. How is this 240 pound brat, this spoiled brat, you can see the emotion there, going to deal with this mental monster from the past that has 160 fights, who has fought every good fighter in the world since he's been fighting, who knows every trick in the book, who is as mentally tough as a piece of steel? You see, we've had a sanctioned fight against the devil who's very good at his craft. He is very sharp and he knows every trick in the book. And yet we are called to be not just muscular monsters, if you want to say it this way, mental monsters. Most of our battle is taking place in this region right here. I just circle for those of you that are getting this podcast, my head. This is up in the head. Most of boxing is in the head. And if you lose your clarity or your soundness of mind, your soundness of judgment, which is what happens when you yield to temptation and you start moving in agreement with temptation, what happens? You become instantly stupid. And the more you progress down that road, you become more stupid. I don't know if you guys have ever tasted of what stupid feels like, but probably every one of us that has flirted with temptation of any sort knows what it's like to be in that sort of <laughs> state. We're like, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but there I am, I'm doing it. And that is part of the drugging that takes place. As a boxer, you recognize soundness of judgment to not allow inebriation at all into your manner in dealing with your enemy is critical to winning the match. So here's Eddie Futch, who was also a trainer from the golden era. And uh, he was asked if Mike Tyson was one of the greatest, five greatest heavyweights of all time. Just, he needs, just needs to make it into the top five, right? He knows he's asking a, you know, one of the old timers. It's going to be a little grouchy about this, but this is Eddie Futch's response. No, Joe Lewis had too much in either hand for Mike. Short, deadly combinations that shake you to your shoes. With Muhammad Ali, Mike wouldn't hit him with a hand grenade. Jersey Joe Walcott would have been too smart for him. Sonny Liston was too big and powerful and had a jarring jab. Rocky Marciano would be hit, that's for sure, but Mike would see violence in spades. You see, there's a generations before us that have lived out Christianity, the strength of Christianity, in such a way that is not just marvelous, it is profound, it is beautiful, it is a sweet science. If you study the movements of Paul in the, in the boxing arena, you stand in awe. I don't know how many of you guys have ever just walked through just the book of Acts and just said, what is he doing? He gets, he gets stoned. I was just going through this on the way to the, the, the supermarket today. He gets stoned in Lystra, carried outside the city, pops back up and does what? goes back in. And he's like, yeah, see, that's one of the techniques we use as boxers. It's like, what is that? That's the opposite of the way we've been trained. If someone wants to stone you, first of all, you run. Don't even go into that city, let alone get stoned, get dragged outside the city, get back up and go back in. What is this? And Paul could say, that's just boxing. That's the way we do it around here. This is the old school, the golden era of boxing. This is what made them great. Learning the sweet science, boxing like the greats. Don't you want to box like the greats? Some of you are starting to think, wait a minute, am I agreeing with the boxing's good if I say that? Uh, like Paul the Apostle, like Peter, like Ignatius, like Richard Wormbrandt, like Leonard Ravenhill, like Hudson Taylor, like George Mueller, Box like the greats. 1 Corinthians 9.27. I box, says Paul, not as one who punches the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. What's the good of laying on the mat and being counted out? You could talk about boxing all day long, but then when you get into the ring, you get knocked out? You see, it's critical that we learn. We don't just share the message, but we learn how to box ourselves. See, it can't be empty words. The reason that Paul's words last throughout the ages, yes, they are God's words, but they're also, they last throughout the ages and they have impact is because he lived them. He was not disqualified. He actually won his bouts. So 
this is 1 Corinthians 9, 27. It's the last verse in chapter 9. Now, the division of chapters didn't exist until much later after the Bible was written. So it's not Paul that said, this is chapter 9. Okay, I'm going to chapter 10. His argument is going to continue into chapter 10. And he's going to say, moreover, brethren... I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock, capitalized, that followed them and that rock was Christ. Isn't that an interesting parallel? To say those that have gone before us drank from this same rock. This is a long history that we have, guys, of boxing. I mean, this is the Roman Empire age that boxing even is going to start to come out. This is like way back with the Greeks. And so you have this ancient art known as boxing. Well, you have an ancient art known as faith. And standing against an enemy in a sanctioned fight. I mean, this is the essence of what Christianity has been, just like boxing is a long history. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness, for their bodies were counted out on the mat. They didn't win the fight. They were in position to win. They had the power to win, but they did not exercise the sweet science. God chose them to reveal his nature, to stand in that arena against that enemy and to win, but God was not pleased with them. Many ended up being knocked out. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So we have an example. Now, this is boxing language here. We have an example of past boxers. And it's like, do you see this example? This guy got knocked out. Why? Take note of that. Because if you live like this, you'll get knocked out too. This guy won. Why? Because he understood how to subject his body to the will of Christ Jesus. He knew how to bring his body under subjection to the rulership of Jesus and say no to these temptations. When the enemy faints against you, a faint is a bluff. And you know, you know this type of move like this. And then the boxer goes this way and then goes, Poof. a faint is just part of the dance. But the enemy faints us and he tries to bait us in. He tries to get us to move. You guys ever seen that, that game? Uh, it has different names, but where one person has their hands like this, one pe- person has their hands like this, and this guy's trying to slap them. And hot hands or something like that. That quickness. And so what they do is you do this, the, the feint, and that guy, if he pulls his hands back, ah, now you get to slap his hands, right? And the enemy faints, and he bluffs, and he tempts, and he's trying to get us to give in to something that will give him a clear shot to knock us out. And so now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now this little segment, 1 Corinthians 10, 7 through 10, is just a continuation. And it's going to walk through the temptations or what we could call the feints of the enemy boxer against us. This is what our enemy specializes in. And this is the sweet science for us to recognize, okay, so this is how we beat them. And do not become idolaters as, some, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. So our trainer, our master coach, is giving us four different tactics of the enemy. You give way to idolatry, knockout. You give way to sexual immorality, knockout. You give way to being, of trying Christ, of, you know, it's the old thing, well, if you were God, then you could do this. Oh, if you were God, then you could try this out. Yeah, if you, you prove to me that I should believe in you. You know, the old trying Christ instead of believing Christ. Or, you complain. And complaint is actually knockout. So these are four tactics right here. So lessons from the golden era. Watch out for these things, these, these enemy knockout, knockout tactics. Idolatry, sexual immorality, testing Christ, complaining. Now, that isn't some spectacular list. 
at first blush, but if you begin to recognize that this is the tactical movements of the enemy against us, and Paul is saying you have an example from all of history, those that have walked by faith, those that have entered this arena and fought the same opponent. You know, what a boxer does when Max Schmeling beat Joe Lewis in their first match, he is going to watch tape on Joe Lewis over and over and over again, and he's going to find Joe Lewis's weakness. Meanwhile, Joe Lewis, eight years younger, and hearing all of the plaudits of how good he is, is going to golf. He found golf, and he's going to golf the entire time he should be training. And he's going to enter into that arena against Max Schmelin, who everyone historically would say is a far, a very inferior fighter to Joe Lewis, and yet that inferior fighter with quotes around it is going to beat Joe Lewis because he's going to study him. Your enemy studies you all the time. He knows exactly when you're golfing, he's got you. Guys, when you're off instead of training and you're golfing and you're like, I got this, he's got you and he's watching your tapes and he knows your weaknesses and he's gonna play those against you. But you can get taped too. It's amazing. When you read the Bible, it's like all the tapes on the enemy. Anything you want to know about what he's up to, his feints and his bluffs, he's like, he's going to try and get you with idolatry. He's going to try and get you to put something and elevate something above Christ in your life. And he's going to want you to hold on to it. And when Christ wants to touch you, you're like, no, no, don't take that. If there's anything in your life that you're like scared that God's going to take away, let God go there. Because that, that idolatry, anytime we elevate something into a God position in our life, it is a certain knockout for us. Sexual immorality, to have a closed door in our life and in our thoughts, to not allow the enemy to just come in at will and to just stick his muddy boots in our living room and our coffee table. He's not allowed in there. This is incredibly important territory in our life. And how we manage it and how we contain it and maintain it is of the utmost importance. Trying Christ with that incredulous attitude, instead of just being a believer that says, my God has this, my God's in control, I trust him. You question God at every turn. Well, God, if you really are God, then I expect you to do this. That type of behavior is going to send you down the river every time, complaining. Well, I, it's sort of like enough said. Life is difficult, life is challenging, your enemy opponent is, seems to be stronger and bigger than you ever would have thought he was, and he has a really hard punch. And when you hit him in the gut, it's a brick wall. It's like, what am I supposed to do with this? Fight him. Fight him in the authority of Jesus Christ. You come back to your, your corner. Have you ever seen one of those boxing movies? And you know, blood's trickling down your face. And your, your trainer leans over. He says, you know what to do. You go in the authority of Christ instead of the authority of your own right fist. You're trying to beat him in your own strength. You'll never beat him that way. He's a brick wall to, to you. But to me, he's like soft like butter. Hit him in the authority of Christ, in the power of my name, and he cannot stand against that. If you know you're going into the ring with that in your fists, you're confident. The problem is many of us aren't confident because we're still trying in our own effort to solve this dilemma of this behemoth in the ring with us. So this is continuing in 1 Corinthians 10. Now, all these things happen to them as examples. So we're going to get this example of idolatry in the Old Testament. And God's going to look at us as a trainer and say, do you see that? See that knockout? So we're going to watch the film with God. That's what looking through the Old Testament is, watching film. And we're watching film on the Israelites. And we're like, wow, they got beat up bad there. And then he's going to show us Phineas. See how Phineas is going to respond? Oh, yeah. He's going to show us Joshua. We're like, oh, yeah. Show us Daniel. We're like, oh, well, that makes sense. Yeah, totally knocked him out. You see, we can look at the failures of Israel as an example. We can also look at the successes of Israel as an example to our soul so that we learn in this ring how we are to live. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Good boxing uh, statement there. No temptation is overtaking you except as is common to man. There is nothing you're going to face in this ring that isn't common to us all. This is not abnormal. This is the match that we've been assigned. It is sanctioned by God. He knows. He could have just taken us up to heaven when we believed. He sets us here and says, you have a job to do. And we're like, that guy's big. 
It's like, yeah, you're called to defeat him. You're called to bring him down, not in your own strength, but in the power of what I gave you. I have given you the victory. Now you need to exercise it in your life. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. The secrets of the seasoned boxer. Experience is a must. All right, guys, this is one of the big impact points for me. I go through a trial. I go through another trial. Yet a third trial. Sometimes they're little uh, combo packages too. Have you ever had that, like a season where it feels like Job? And they all sort of bunch up on you. Yeah, I'm guessing some of you have tasted that too. The bunch season. And yet, the whole while, you're oftentimes wishing for the trials to be done. And then when those trials are done, what are you wishing for? Never to have another trial. God, I've already had my trials. I think that should be sufficient to train me. That's like boxing once a year, getting one bout and trying to be spared all other bouts. And you want to pick your bout. That's actually what boxers will do too. It's like, I don't want to fight that guy. I don't want to, okay, I'll take on that guy, that little shrimp over there. I'll take on that one. You see, in the kingdom of heaven, we don't pick our bouts. God is our trainer and he's the one that picks our bouts for us. And our opinion of God's ability to choose bouts for us is a little dubious, isn't it? I don't know that we think God's very good at this because like, God, you didn't think this through. I just had a trial. I just had a bout last you know, week. I, I'm not really ready for another bout here. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. I have given you and supplied you with everything you need for life and godliness. I have given you the victory. No weapon or no boxer fashioned against you is going to prosper. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against you. Greater is he who is in you than he that is coming against you in this ring. If God be for you, who can stand against you? Fact. And for boxers, that's incredibly important. But how do you learn it? You need experience. What should Eric have by now? A little experience? I hope so. Because trial after trial after trial after trial, and you, you know, just mountains full of trials in my life. Bouts is what we could call them. The greatest boxers are the ones who are seasoned veterans. They understand all the moves. They recognize it a mile away. Even when the guy's getting out of his corner, they're like, ah, I know exactly what that guy's doing. And they, they recognize their weaknesses because we've studied film. We know our enemy and we know how to take him down. We also know how he has taken us down in the past. And we know that when we fell for that feint of his, oh, he got us. And so what do we become? Seasoned. I'm not falling for that one again. And so we can chuckle in, inwardly, even though we're not too excited about it because it's a dark memory there when we fall flat, fell flat on our back and we're counted 10. Oh, but we get back up and we go back at it. Experience is a must. To maintain your timing, get in the ring often. You know that if you were to actually see this from a God lens, you'd recognize that every trial is what keeps you sharp. If you don't have trials, you're going to get out of shape and you're going to lose something known as timing. Muhammad Ali is going to take off three years, not because he wanted to, but because he wouldn't uh, accept draft into the Vietnam War. And so the boxing uh, organization is going to exclude him and basically kick him out. And then once the Vietnam War fell into you know, bad favor with the public, then they felt awkward and took him back. So after three years, the champion is going to come back and he's going to be rusty. It's called ring rust. You don't want ring rust, guys. Ring rust is a lack of timing. It doesn't mean he wasn't training. He was strong, he was fast, but he didn't have his timing down. And your timing is everything. How do you get timing? You have to fight. Fighting against opponents is actually what gets your timing down. It's, it's a rhythm to the soul. The same is true in our life. Our trials are our gift. And when we receive our trials and our difficulties every day and we stand up in the ring and go to meet it instead of sit in our corner and go, not again, we're going to win this thing. So ring rust is to be shunned. I, it's funny because all of us just sort of really wish we could have some ring rust. I don't really want to be in that ring anymore. 
Can I have some ring rust, please? You have to be dead set against ring rust. It is a chief enemy in your life. Embrace those challenges. If you happen to get the bonus versions, I sometimes feel like I get extra attention from trials in my life. Praise God, because you could be a stronger fighter. That's actually what you want. You know, there are these old fighters, I don't remember their names, that some of them fought like 200 plus fights and they never won a world championship because no one would fight them. None of the champions would fight them. And don't you sort of want to be one of those guys where the enemy's afraid to fight you? He's like, come on, hey, where are my trials? Hey, I'm looking for more trials. And the enemy's like, don't touch that guy. He's going to beat you up. Oh, isn't that a dream for a Christian? Some of you are like, I wasn't thinking about that as my dream. Sanctioned fights are your bread and butter. The old fashioned boxer, this is how they lived. And guess what? They had to be good fighters. Why? Because if they broke a hand, broke a nose, did something, they couldn't fight for a long time. They have to have the defense and the offense mixed because they have to win, yes, but they also need to win for it, be available to the next fight. This is their bread and butter. The same is true with us. This is our bread and butter. And every time a, a trial comes, you're like, oh, good. I get to make some spiritual dough today. Uh, this is how we make our income spiritually, if you want to say it that way. So we get excited. You can't lose if you heed your trainer. If you listen to your trainer and you listen to his voice and you follow his, not just example, but then you heed his direction in the ring, you're going to win every time, every single time. It's when you tune him out and you say, I've got this. I'll take this myself and you fall for the enemy's tactics, you go down. We're gonna finish with this, Romans 5, three through five. We glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So I'm gonna give you a boxing version of this. We glory in every sanctioned bout, knowing that every sanctioned bout produces sharpness in the boxer and sharpness in the boxer seasoning and experience and seasoning and experience confidence of victory. Now our confidence of victory as a spiritual boxer does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Do you have a confidence in your victory? You see, the reason you have confidence in victory is because you've gone into your sanctioned bouts and you've embraced them and you've watched God win. When you are willing to walk through that instead of shun your sanctioned bouts, like, oh, go, God, not again. I, I don't want another trial. I don't want another difficulty. When you're willing to embrace those, then that becomes your confidence of victory. Ultimately, that's what it's translated into. You are one of those mental monsters that knows up here that your enemy fears you. And you can't wait to get back in the ring and demonstrate the glory of the heavenlies in this earth afresh. We have the unique privilege of doing that, guys. God has chosen us as his demonstrations of his invisible realm. His glory, his power is meant to be showcased through our battling in that ring. Are we getting stronger or weaker at our sport? It's interesting, you can, usually it's gonna be somewhere between 18 and 28, 30, 35, somewhere in that zone. Those are your strong years. And then you can sort of peter off. So I'm at 52, you can just imagine how much petering I could be doing right now. I'm not interested in petering off. As far as I'm concerned, according to the sweet science, the older boxers, age-wise, should be the strongest which means I should be able to take on an 18 year old spiritually and look pretty good in the ring. My little, my footwork is looking really good. Don't exactly know what footwork looks like for boxing, but it's something like that. It looks sort of like a Jewish dance. So a 52 year old that knows the sweet science should actually be stronger spiritually with that enemy than even an 18 year old. And that means a 97 year old should actually be growing in strength with every passing year. And yet what typically happens in American Christianity is we decline as we get older. 
we leave it to the next generation to sort of carry the torch. I want us to invert that. The wedding at Cana, Jesus' first miracle, what did he do? He changed the tradition. They bring out the best wine first and then it, the lesser wine as it goes. Jesus shows up, he flips it. The better wine comes out as it progresses. Same with us. As we progress, this needs to change. Starts in us individually because we could complain about the fact that the church is getting weaker out there and not stronger, but that's only gonna change when we choose mentally to say, I'm getting stronger instead of weaker. I'm going towards strength and not accepting weakness. It's high time we knock off. Sorry, guys, off is misspelled. That's terrible. It's high time we knock off some of this rust. If you have ring rust or you're craving ring rust or you're accepting ring rust, it's messing with your timing, guys. Seasoned boxers know they have to be in the ring. They accept every sanctioned bout from the Heavenly Father. And they're like, Lord, thank you for this. Keep me sharp. Keep me seasoned. Oh, oh this is, I did, forgot that I added this in. So Joe Frazier, no, this is you. This is you talking. I know you look sort of like Joe Frazier in this quote. It was good enough for them. It's good enough for me. If it was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. What your trainer says goes. You listen to that trainer known as the word of God, the Holy Spirit, you're not going to fail. Father, train us. Make us spiritual athletes. Mental monsters to take on the enemy. May we know the truth and may that truth set us free in the ring. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd put the weight of heavenly power in our fists. And as we fight our battles today, I pray that the enemy would feel it, that he would feel the pain, that he would recognize that the church of Jesus Christ is being awakened. Lord, we love you and we trust you. It's in the precious name we pray, amen.